Peace be with you, friends. It is, uh, this week is our last one on our quick tour through the life of Paul. As we almost read this morning, one of the passages was Paul, um, Paul's encounter with, well, so we started out with Paul's encounter with the road, Christ on the road to Damascus. Um, is it going? Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so the first Sunday we were here at Good Shepherd, actually, we we heard about Paul on the road to Damascus. And then the week after that was the passage that we almost read, which was Paul healing a servant girl and then going to jail for it. And and um, and in the end, um, having a conversion of the jailer at the place where he was. So um, that was one of them. Uh, the third one was Paul in Athens preaching a story. We were outside, so maybe we weren't, you know, it was a fun day for that. And then um, last week, we heard Paul writing to the believers in Philippi, so the beginning of the letter that we just heard um, today, and giving thanks for the ways that they have been supporting him uh, while he's in jail. So like I said, this week is a continuation of that reading. Paul is in jail, and he's writing to people he loves about what it means to accept and to live out this good news about Jesus that has taken hold of him and them together. I just want to be sure this is good. Okay, good. Uh, so, thank you for reading. Appreciate it. Let's begin with a prayer. Good and loving God, let your spirit of love fill all our lives. Give us the courage, the patience, and the willingness to love each other and to love even the people closest to us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our example and our leader in the art of love. Amen. So, um, Heather and I live in southwest Baltimore in a neighborhood called Morrill Park. And Morrill Park is different from most of the places I lived in my life. It's not the suburbs, and it's not a university town. It is working class Baltimore. And we've been there for about eight years now, and when we first were looking to move there, I had a variety of reasons why the neighborhood appealed to me. It was convenient to the highway, to the city, and to Columbia, where Heather's job was at the time. There was a church in the neighborhood that I wanted to go to because I knew the pastor, and so I realized that that reason uh, totally indicates in one more way how I'm a huge church nerd that I was choosing my neighborhood based on a church, uh, but it, you know, that's how we found the neighborhood. So I'm just telling the truth here. Another important reason that we chose the neighborhood is because the housing was affordable, and finally, because of the year that I'd spent as a full-time volunteer in a different low-income neighborhood in Washington, D.C., I had these ideas about solidarity and about making a difference and contributing in a me meaningful way to the neighborhood where we lived by living there, uh, being part of it. So now, has it worked out that way? I'm not sure. Um, I lost patience with the community meetings and all the complaints about rats, crimes, and teenagers, so I don't go to those very often. Um, and honestly, in some ways, I think our neighbors have uh, done more for us and given us all kinds of gifts for Anne to a greater degree than I really feel like I'm helping out or giving back. Although, and I want to say thank you for your help with this in April, um, I've been trying to get a little something started with um, planting trees in our neighborhood. Uh, but part of that reason is that it came to my attention that that would be a good thing is because we learned recently that the air quality in our neighborhood is some of the worst in Baltimore. So in a certain way, our scripture reading makes me think about this choice to live in our neighborhood as being kind of a parallel with the story Paul tells about Jesus, in the sense of making a choice to give up a certain kind of comfort and privilege and to live with folks who've always lived without that comfort and that privilege. And I don't want to be like, oh, I'm just like Jesus, but just like I see the parallel in a way, like where you live. And with that in mind, it's an amazing thing to think about what Jesus did. Because I have to tell you that just the small crossover that we're doing is hard to deal with sometimes. Our house is smaller than the ones I grew up in, and so I have dreams on a regular basis that there is a storage space in our house that I've forgotten about, right? And that it's there, and I just have to open a certain door, and suddenly um, there, is, there will be enough space to hold all our stuff. Right? And we won't have to worry about storage anymore. And then I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh, Anne's closet does not open up to a 25 square foot storage space. And I'm disappointed about it. So there's like a psychological thing going up there. Sorry to share my dreams with you, but you know. Anyway. And then in terms of the 
the neighborhood itself. It is tough sometimes walking down the alley past a bunch of pit bulls that are barking in their muddy backyards, and there's dead rats. And then you get to the playground, and there's a bunch of glass on the ground, and there's trash up against the fence. And I worry about what it will be like for Anne to go to the public school with these same kids that we hear swearing and yelling at each other. Plus, like I mentioned, it turns out the air quality is some of the worst in the city, and that's where we live, and that's where we breathe. So how is it possible, I wonder, for God to show up in our neighborhood, in our human neighborhood, and live down the street from us, and never just get in his car and take a shopping trip to Columbia, or take a break and go out to a nice restaurant, get online and just check the Zillow listings, to uh, see how much it would cost to move somewhere more celestial, right? Jesus lived among us as a poor and a powerless person, a slave even, as our reading tells it, and gave up all the trappings, all the prestige, all the power that would otherwise be accorded to the omnipotent creator of the universe. God moved into the neighborhood and made a total commitment. God loves us that much. God loves us enough to give up the meditative sanctuary in the suburbs and move right next door to our anxieties, our depression, our rage, our shame and guilt. God doesn't mind the noise when our lives are falling apart and we're making a racket at three in the morning. That's why she's here. That's why Christ was born into the world. We are loved deeply, madly, truly even when our lawns are covered with dandelions. So what would it look like to respond in kind? What would it look like to have the same mind, the same outlook on life, the same practical wisdom that allowed Jesus to give up his privilege in favor of God's plan to save the world? What would it look like to be a part of a community where we put each other first and learn to practice a humble love? So, so here's one way we can do it we can make a habit of giving money away to other people and to change lives. I didn't think this was going to be a money sermon when I first started looking at the scripture, but here's the thing. What could be more practical, right? What's more practical and direct and measurable is a way of putting someone else's needs ahead of your own than to give a person or an organization that does good uh, some of your money, right? What more straightforward way could there be to supporting your fellow church folk than to contribute to our common life? And if you're already giving money on a regular basis, then your next challenge is to up the percentage of your income that you give away. I think 10%, for example, will most likely require some lifestyle adjustments. Living in a neighborhood, for example, that is not necessarily your first choice. Or buying a used car instead of a new one. Um, like large choices and that is a good thing because those are practical ways of putting other people's needs before your own by giving sacrificially one of the things that one of the ways that we practice this at 6 8 is through our justice tithe so 10 percent of our offerings go to nonprofit organizations looking to make the world a better place and we got a letter this week from earl's place which is a transitional shelter for men that was started by UCC churches in Baltimore. Um, so this letter, uh, so men live in the in the shelter for uh, like around 18 months, and it's not a temporary shelter. It's a place to live, but also a place to kind of like get on their feet and get some services, and and ideally then they move into permanent housing from there. So this letter is um, from Sheila, the executive director, who writes about one of the men whose life has changed because of his time at Earl's Place. So she writes about Anthony. During his time here, Anthony has created a foundation for a brighter future. He reconnected with his family for the first time in 14 years. He celebrated over three years of recovery from alcoholism. He received staff support that gave him a roadmap for independence. Anthony told us recently, I have never had so many people on my side in my entire life. So, um, so that's just one simple way. Another way that I'd like to lift up is a way that we can answer Paul's call to humble love is in the way we go about our life together as a church. We already have a clear commitment to welcoming people in, in our um, sort of like information about ourselves. And when I've heard back from visitors, 
they've consistently tell me when I hear back from them that they felt very welcomed, right? If you don't hear back from them, I don't know. But the ones who write me back say, yeah, we felt really welcome. So the next step after welcoming as we make decisions and put this young community together is to keep folks in mind, keep in prayer, the people who aren't here yet, the people we haven't met yet, which is sort of a weird thing to do, right? Like, I haven't met that person, how can I be praying for them? But maybe, so maybe the people who aren't here yet are just like us and simply haven't found out about us yet, in which case the welcome will need to include invitations to let people know what's going on. But it's also possible that the people who aren't here yet, that are called to be, may need us to live our, be or to live our life together a little differently from what's convenient for us. And a mark of maturity in our faith is to be able to value and to create space for something that may or may not be all that meaningful for us or convenient, but that makes all the difference for someone coming in new. And what would that thing be? I don't know. That's a good question. We'll have to use our imaginations. What might it look like if we were to do these two things, to find ways to put others first in our personal financial lives and to keep space in our imaginations for people who aren't here yet or in our life together in church? Well, the short answer is that this kind of thing brings to light the kingdom of God and helps us enter more and more into the love of Jesus. Another way of saying it is that it will help us live into God's will and to God's energy for us. In this scripture passage, Paul sets a strong challenge before the Christians at Philippi. Have the same mind, the same attitude was the translation we heard, the same outlook, the same practical wisdom as Jesus. But in the end, he tells them and us, all of this is actually born, actually carried out by God's Spirit working in us. We don't do this only on our own power or with our own gifts and abilities. Now, I said that Jesus didn't take breaks from living in the neighborhood, but I don't know if that's strictly true. If you notice in the Gospels, Jesus did have this habit of wandering off to pray. And granted, he wasn't re-entering into a place of privilege exactly, but he was returning to a place of safety and a place where he could be reminded in God's presence of God's love and God's hope for redeeming the world and Jesus' value and worth in the grand scheme of things in spite of present appearances. Now, I may not have made our neighborhood sound all that appealing in my description of it, but what makes up for a lot of the inconveniences and the difficulties is the people, the relationships with our neighbors. Just yesterday, the woman who's behind us to the left showed up with new shoes that she thought Anne might want to wear. Um, like, they've been worn one time. She's like, can Anne wear these? Um, but they were too big. But still, she like showed up. Or I got locked out of the house the other day, and my next door neighbor's mother-in-law came over in like 10 minutes, and we got back into the house. No problem. Um, and when we had all the snow in 2010, it was really irritating that the snow plows like never plowed our, our road, right? But um, it was super fun to be out there with our neighbors and like we had shovels, but we had pickaxes. We were like pickaxing the snow together. So I don't know. It would have never happened if we lived in a neighborhood where you pay the plow to come to you, right? Those things just wouldn't have happened. And that is what it's all about for God, the relationship with us. My hope and my prayer is that by the grace of God and in harmony with God's will, we will accept and respond to that invitation to relationship and be empowered to a humble love when they can let go of status and privilege. Maybe accept with joy the gift that knowing that in the kingdom of God, in the world that God is bringing into reality in and through Jesus, we are deeply loved just as we are. May it be so, in the name of the one who humbled himself for our sakes. Amen. Um, so I don't know if my discussion question is on topic at all, but we'll see what it is. What does walk humbly with God mean to you? Okay, that works. We'll go with it.